Okay. Okay, so this is a qualifier for Suhail. Um, he's gonna go uh, give a talk, any clarifying questions, uh, go ahead. Uh, and then uh, uh, the qualifying committee, which is um, uh, Drew, Hartmut, uh, Michael, and myself will uh, ask questions first, first, and then the audience will ask questions, and then we'll uh, debate on the fate of this um, qualifier. All right, with that, uh, uh, Suhail, you want to take over? All right, uh, thank you, Max, uh, for the introduction. Um, all right, um, so uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to my uh, qualifier talk today. Uh, my name is Mohammed Suhail Salim, and uh, today I will be presenting my work titled uh, Search Based Path Planning for a High Dimensional Manipulator in Cluttered Environments Using Optimization Based Primitives. I know that the title is a bit of a mouthful, but we will slowly break this down through the course of the presentation. So uh, before I uh, proceed any further, I would like to specifically thank my committee members, uh, Max, Michael, Hartmut, and Thru uh, for uh, agreeing to be a part of my uh, committee and giving me valuable feedback. Thank you. All right, uh, then um, let's dive right in. Mm -hmm. So the motivation for uh, our work is the task of autonomously inspecting a highly cluttered gas turbine. So a gas turbine, as you can see on the image, is a complex machine consisting of a large number of components which are stacked next to each other in close proximity. Given the cluttered environment created by the components, as well as the fact that the entire turbine is enclosed in a casing, makes it infeasible to effectively inspect the turbine manually. Hence, we require a robotic system to be able to perform this task for us. And of all the components that are present in the gas turbine, we are specifically interested in inspecting the blade, uh, inspecting the disks that are highlighted in red, which consists of a large number of blades present next to each other. So ideally, we would like our robot system um, to enter through a port that is present on the casing um, and navigate around the disks as well as the blades in order to reach the regions of inspection and provide us with valuable visual feedback. So if we were to take a closer look at the uh, cross section of the environment that the robot would have to traverse, it would look something similar to the video that we see here, uh, where a large number of blades will be stacked next to each other, which in turn creates narrow passages and constrained spaces that the robot would have to traverse in order to reach the inspection regions. So clearly a task of this nature would require a slender and highly flexible robotic system. And for this purpose, we use a 21 dimensional snake robot like manipulator. So basically the robot is composed of 10 flexible units where each unit is attached to the previous one through a two axis W joint, meaning that each unit can yaw and pitch with respect to the previous unit. And the first unit is attached to a fixed base through a prismatic actuator that basically propels the entire robot ahead. So the robot is capable of executing complex maneuvers similar to the one that you see on the slide. So while the robot is very similar to that of a snake robot, one of the fundamental differences arises from the fact that uh, our robot is propelled by an external prismatic actuator, whereas a snake robot would have to propel itself by making contact with surfaces. We also have a camera that is attached to the end effector of the robot that is basically used for the um, for providing visual feedback. Um, for providing visual feedback. And on the right here, you can see images of uh, three units of the 10 unit system. Um, and you can also uh, get an idea about the scale as well as the size of the robot. So uh, now that we are aware of the uh, environment uh, that we have to inspect as well as the robot that we have, the overall goal is to develop a planning module that in a reasonable amount of time can identify plans similar to the one that you see on the slide here so that the robot can navigate around the blades of the turbine and reach the end effector forces. So based on the planning problem at hand, uh, the planner would have to identify plans that allow the robot to both pitch as well as yaw in order to reach the desired end effector poses. But however, developing a planner uh, for uh, this problem is a challenging task because of two major factors. The first being that uh, the system is extremely high dimensional. So a typical seven dimensional manipulation planning problem is considered a high dimensional problem. And here we are trying to solve a planning problem in 21 dimensions. The next major factor is the fact that the environment is extremely constrained, meaning that the robot would have to execute complex motions in the joint space in order to see trivial progress in the end effector space. 
So the planner would have to identify complex motions in a reasonable amount of time. So both of these challenges makes the planning problem difficult and time consuming to solve, calling for uh, the development of intelligent planning approaches. So um, yeah, now that we have an idea about the uh, problem that we are solving, let us formally ground the problem. Um, it is to find a sequence of uh, states pi star from a start configuration S star to an end defector goalpost while minimizing a cost function and ensuring that all the transitions are valid. So for our domain, it makes sense to define the goal in the end defector space because ultimately all we care about is visual feedback. And since the camera is situated on the end defector, we define the uh, goal in the end defector space. And uh, the cost function that we end up minimizing for this problem is path length. And one thing that is also worth mentioning is that uh, we are provided with a controller that is capable of linearly interpolating between states. So given a sequence of states, um, the controller linearly interpolates between the sequence. So for the path to be valid, the linear interpolation between the sequence of states has to be collision free as well. So yeah, now that we have an overall idea of uh, the problem and the problem has been motivated, uh, the outline for the rest of the talk is as follows. Um, over the next slide, we will look at uh, some of the possible approaches one could take for a problem of this nature, uh, followed by which we will uh, get a brief description of the contributions this work makes. Then uh, we will look at some related uh, literature to these contributions. And before uh, going into the uh, details of the approach, we will uh, ha I will be giving a small um, search-based planning primer so that we understand the need uh, for the contributions, followed by which uh, we will look into the results and then conclude the talk. All right, uh, then so for a problem of this nature, uh, there are three major classes of um, classical planning approaches uh, one could adopt, namely um, random uh, sampling based approaches, project optimization techniques, and heuristic search approaches. So uh, typically at the core of um, sampling based approaches is a tree data structure uh, where, where the nodes uh, in the tree are robot states and the edges are basically transitions between these robot states. So typically sampling based algorithms operate by slowly growing this tree uh, by extending it towards randomly sampled states in the configuration space of the system. So while this class of approaches are very well known for their scalability to high dimensional problems, unfortunately they are not going to be as effective for our domain because of the extensive space constraints that is, that is present in the environment. So the space constraints uh, prevent the tree from growing effectively towards these randomly sampled states. And because of this reason, it might take a sampling based algorithm a large amount of time before it ends up identifying a solution, which is something that uh, we do not prefer. So we also have experimental evidence, uh, which confirms the same, uh, which we will gloss over at um, towards the end of the presentation, basically. The next major class of approaches that uh, we can consider would be trajectory optimization techniques. So while these seem like attractive op options because they directly operate in the continuous space, using them to plan a long horizon path uh, for a hyper redundant system like ours, in an environment which is riddled with constraints and minimas, it is highly likely that the optimizer uh, takes a large amount of time and, and there's a good chance that it does not converge uh, to the globally optimal solution. And ultimately what we would like is a globally optimal solution. So um, yeah, that basically leaves us only with the heuristic search based techniques. So search-based approaches um, typically operate by systematically discretizing the state space and the action space of the system and transforming a continuous space problem into a discrete graph. And a solution for the planning problem is identified by searching this discrete graph in an ordered fashion. So these approaches in general come with strong guarantees like completeness and suboptimality bounds, meaning that given enough time, the, uh, they are guaranteed to identify a feasible solution for the problem if one exists within the discretization that we made. And this solution is guaranteed to be optimal or within a factor of the optimal solution. So these are attractive guarantees that we would like our planner to possess. Further, uh, the structured environment which is created by the turbine weights also provides us with the opportunity to compute informative heuristic functions that the search algorithm can utilize in order to uh, quickly guide the search and um, uh, converge to a solution. So these reasons combined with the fact that search-based planners have in the past shown good performance on um, uh, long horizon tasks for high dimensional systems makes this class of algorithms a suitable choice for our problem. So uh, while there has been success in using search-based methods for manipulation planning, uh, the complexity of our domain um, makes direct extensions of such approaches ineffective. 
So we have to adopt a, a search strategy with our own modifications and contributions. So yeah, the contributions that we make are geared towards modifying choices that you would traditionally make if you were to employ a search-based planning algorithm uh, for the task of manipulation because of their ineffectiveness in our domain. The first being associated with the action set. So in general manipulation domains, you tend to predefine a simple action set and uh, construct a graph uh, using this action set and find a solution. But however, uh, this is going to be unsuitable for our problem due to the extensive space constraints that is present. Uh, and utilizing a simple predefined action set inevitably drives the search into a minima. So to handle this problem, we developed a scheme wherein we generate useful actions online that would allow the search to make progress towards the goal without getting stuck in minimas. And we formulated the optimization problem uh, and we formulated this as an optimization problem. So solving the optimization would basically give us uh, the uh, actions. But however, the problem with this is the fact that in a typical uh, planning problem, you would have to um, generate millions and millions of um, actions, and it is infeasible to query the optimizer for every single one of them. So we employed a couple of optimizations in order to minimize the queries to the optimizer. Uh, the first being that we use the optimization based actions in conjunction with the predefined action set. And the second is the fact that we use the optimization based primitives in a lazy fashion. So I, I will go into the details of uh, what laziness means uh, in the context of search uh, and uh, towards a later point uh, in the presentation. So the next major item uh, in, this, uh, in contributions would be uh, related to the heuristic functions. So due to the extensive reachability constraints that is present in our environment, uh, traditional heuristic functions are ineffective for our problem. So we adapted and utilized um, what we refer to as homotopy-based heuristics that have an additional layer of reasoning that helps us avoid the problems caused by the traditional choices. So these two items basically sums up the um, major set of contributions this work makes. So next up, we will look at uh, three bodies of um, related work that is um, very closely tied to the domain as well as the specific contributions that we make. The first one is associated with the online generation action generation scheme. Uh, so there have been works in the past that have explored the context of uh, generating actions online within the, the, con the context of search-based planning. And each of them have had their own flavor as well as motivation behind them. For example, uh, adaptive motion parameters developed by Cohen et al are generated from states that are closer to the goal, such that these actions always end up at the goal. And there are works also in mobile robot navigation that generate do-wins curves online from different portions in the search space. So our contribution of optimization-based actions will, fa will fall within this body of work, where uh, primitives are generated online in order to accelerate the performance of the search algorithm. The second body of work would be related to uh, homotopy-based heuristics. So there has been a few, um, uh, few works which have developed techniques to plan while accounting for homotopy classes in two dimensions as well as in three dimensions. And our contribution here is to purely adapt this literature into our domain and utilize it effectively. The third body of work uh, that is to be mentioned uh, would be the uh, motion planning uh, for snake robots. Uh, so uh, the, there has been a large amount of focus um, here uh, for motion planning for snake robots, uh, but uh, typically the majority of the focus is uh, geared towards synthesizing motions that reason about the gates of the snake robot so that the robot can utilize the contacts it makes with the ground uh, in order to propel itself ahead. This is tangential to the focus of our work where we would like the robot to navigate without making contact uh, with any surfaces. So this basically sums up the three bodies of related work uh, that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention. So yeah, um, before uh, we proceed any further, let me give a brief overview of how a search-based uh, planning algorithm operates so that we can uh, appreciate the uh, need for the contributions. So uh, given a simple planning problem, uh, similar to the one that you see on the slide here, where a robot, a point robot is tasked with getting from a start uh, position to a goal position while avoiding um, the obstacles that are highlighted in gray. Uh, the search typically operates uh, by defining a small discrete action set that the robot can take from uh, any state that it is present at. A simple example for, a, for an action set would be the four connected grid. That is uh, the robot is allowed to move along the four cardinal directions by unit amount. So now the search utilizes this predefined action set uh, and applies um, uh, th these, uh, these actions to the start state 
to identify the set of successors or the set of states that you can reach from the start state. Since none of these states belong, uh, belong to the goal set, uh, this process of applying the actions is repeated from the successor states. So slowly the search keeps growing until you eventually end up finding a path to the goal. So this is uh, in general how an uninformed uh, search-based planning algorithm operates. There are two major points here that I would like to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, the first being that- uh, Morning. The first, I'm sorry, uh, can everyone mute themselves? Thank you. Um, so the, the, uh, there are two important uh, points that uh, I would like to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, the first one uh, being that um, what has ended up happening here is that the action set has ended up implicitly defining a graph. Uh, where uh, the actions are the edges and the nodes are basically the robot states these actions lead to. So clearly uh, the action set is fundamental to the functioning of a search algorithm. The second point that is worth mentioning is that the reason behind choosing the simple action set uh, is that uh, you can obtain complicated motions by sequencing these simple primitives one after the other, while at the same time, uh, you can keep the branching factor of the graph small. So the branching factor of this graph that we see here in front of us is directly related to the size of the action set that you choose. So by choosing the simple action set, you have kept the graph small while at the same time, more complex motions can be constructed. So now that we have, um, so this is in general how an uninformed search algorithm operates. Um, yeah. Now that we have an understanding of how the uh, search-based planning approach operates as well as how the action spaces relates to the functioning of the search algorithm, let us look at a simple example um, to understand the impact of a useful action space. So um, consider the example that you see here on the slide where uh, the task is uh, exactly the same as before uh, to get from a start configuration to the goal while avoiding collisions uh, with the gray obstacles. So if we were to define um, the action set to be uh, similar to what we had done before where we can move along the four cardinal directions, uh, since uh, moving north or moving east would cause the robot to collide with the environment, the search would have had to find a solution that takes the robot all the way around the obstacle. And identifying such a long solution would also have required a significant amount of computational effort, as can be seen from the sheer, uh, sheer number of nodes that are generated. But on the other hand, if we were to slightly alter the action space, where in this case, we were allowed to move along the diagonals as well, uh, the search would have trivially found a solution where the optimal action is just a single action long. So basically an intelligent choice for an action set can provide you with two advantages. The first is the fact that the path length can be um, significantly short. And the second is that the amount of search effort that is required to identify such a solution is also on the lower side. And the latter point is very important for a domain like ours where the search space is extremely large and we are trying to minimize the search effort as much as possible. So yeah, this is the overall uh, primer that I wanted to give about search-based planning so that we have an understanding of um, how a search-based algorithm operates and how action spaces relate to uh, search-based algorithms and their performances. So now that we have this knowledge, um, I believe we are equipped enough in order to delve into the details of the contributions itself. Uh, first up, the contribution would be the optimization-based actions. So uh, in general manipulation domains, uh, the action set that is uh, predefined is uh, very similar to the, what we had seen before, where each degree of freedom is moved individually. So basically the action set would comprise of uh, individual joint angle movements uh, by small amounts. Uh, while this works uh, in general very well for common manipulation domains, uh, this does not extend well to our domain and let us see uh, an example as to why. So consider the example here where you have the robot state as well as uh, the, the turbine blades that the robot is navigating around as well, and uh, you have the goal that is defined in the end effector space. Ideally, you would like the robot um, to execute complex maneuvers like the one that you see on the image. So this would allow the robot to make meaningful progress towards the goal. But however, since our action set comprises of only um, single joint angle movements, we would have to construct such a complex maneuver by moving each joint individually. But the problem with that is the fact that moving each joint individ individually inevitably causes the robot to collide with the environment due to the constraints of the environment. So although, um, so basically we require a better action set that can move multiple joints at the same time, uh, allowing it to make meaningful progress towards the goal. So um, the natural question could be, why can't you add uh, complicated motions that move multiple joints at the same time as part of your action set? 
And the answer to that is the fact that uh, we have a 21 dimensional system and the sheer number of combinations that can be generated um, is significantly high. So in fact, the total number of actions that move just two joints at a time is of the order of 420. So it is infeasible or impractical to enumerate all of the actions and include that as a, a part of your action space because that would blow up the size of your graph. So clearly we need something uh, a little smarter here and um, that led to the development of the optimization based primitives. So what we do is um, instead of using a simple predefined action set, we resorted to generating actions based on the state of the system that are useful and would allow the state to progress online. So for, given a problem of this nature, useful actions from the state are generated online and these are used to extend the search until you eventually end up finding a goal. And this process of action generation is uh, formulated as an optimization problem. So basically querying the optimizer would give, uh, from the current state would give us the uh, actions that are useful and would allow the search to progress. So this is how the optimization based actions function uh, in an overall sense. So now that we know how it operates in the toy example, let's go back to our um, original domain and understand how we exactly formulate this. So given um, a robot state as well as the uh, turbine blades, uh, the goal is to generate actions that are useful and uh, would allow the robot to progress. But unfortunately, it is infeasible to reason about what would be a useful action in the 21 dimensional space. But we do know that at the end of the day, what we want is for the end effector to move effectively and to reach the goal. So we define useful actions as ones that cause um, meaningful end effector movements. So we define end effector positions that we would like the robot to move to and basically end up querying the optimizer to generate the action so that the robot can move from the current state to these end effector positions. So basically these actions are then uh, utilized in order to keep growing the search until um, we find a path to the goal. So this is how the optimization based actions are, um, are formulated and generated. And basically there's just uh, a single module that needs to be defined uh, uh, in order to completely define the concept of optimization based actions. And uh, that would be the uh, objective function. So the goal uh, is basically to generate the entire uh, neighbor state configuration S dash, given the current robot state S, as well as the end effector position that we would like the robot to move to G. So basically uh, we have our uh, objective function F of G, which is comprising of uh, three different components. The first one being the obstacle cost. So this cost uh, component of the cost function basically ensures that the generated neighboring state configuration S dash is collision free and does not intersect with any of the turbine blades. The second component F goal basically ensures that the generated neighbor S dash has its end effector position at the defined, pose, uh, defined end effector pose G. So this is a simple uh, 3D Euclidean distance between the end effector of the generated state and the uh, end effector pose that we had defined. And the final uh, third and the final component F state basically ensures uh, that the amount of reconfiguration between the current robot state S as well as the neighboring state configuration S dash is minimal. So while the first comp um, is minimal, so basically uh, we would like the end effector of the robot to um, progress while um, causing minimal amount of movement in the joint space because ultimately we are trying to minimize uh, path length in the configuration space. And also minimizing the reconfiguration ensures that the chances of you colliding with the environment is on the lower side. So basically these are the three components of the, um, of the cost function. Um, given this objective, we use a gradient free uh, black box optimizer uh, to generate the successes from the current state. So this is the um, whole concept of the optimization based primitives. Uh, I'll briefly, briefly uh, pause here for uh, 10 to 15 seconds. Um, if you guys have any very, very minor questions, I'll be happy to answer them now with regards to the optimization based primitives or anything I have covered so far. All right then, um, so yeah, this is the whole concept of optimization based primitives. Um, so basically we um, query the optimizer um, from every state in order to generate the actions that would allow the search to progress. But the problem with this is the fact that optimization is a computationally expensive affair if, in comparison to just using a predefined action set. And uh, given that in a typical search problem, you are going to encounter millions and millions of states, it is uh, infeasible to uh, generate actions online for each of these states. 
So we perform a couple of optimizations in order to help us speed up this process by minimizing queries to the optimizer. The first one being that um, we use the optimization based primitives in conjunction with the traditional uh, predefined action set. So the predefined action set is used as much as possible. And whenever the search is driven into a minima, when it utilizes the uh, predefined action set, the optimizer is queried to generate successes that will help the search escape this minima and progress towards the goal. So this is the first idea. The second idea is a little more convoluted and it is the concept of lazy generation. So laziness in search typically refers to delaying the computational bottleneck of your search as much as possible. And in general robotics problems, this uh, computational bottleneck has always been um, collision checking or edge validation. So meaning that you have a robot state as well as the action you want the robot state to take. Validating whether this edge is uh, collision free or not is the most um, uh, computationally expensive part. But however, the bottleneck in our domain is a little different. It is the generation of the edge itself, meaning that given the robot state, the action that we would like the robot uh, that we would like the robot to take from the state, this generation is the computational bottleneck. So uh, basically, uh, there is a lot of literature um, about uh, how to delay the bottleneck with regards to edge uh, validation, and we adopt that lazy literature to suit our our uh, own needs. So in order to understand uh, the uh, flavor of um, laziness, um, let us go back to our uh, running example. So given this planning problem, um, unlike uh, an uninformed search, a heuristic search algorithm would utilize a heuristic to uh, direct uh, the expansion of the search. So instead of searching the entire space, uh, the search ends up expanding or uh, the search en ends up searching only the most promising regions that is identified heuristically. So given a set of four successors, uh, the search utilizes a heuristic to identify which would be the most promising one to expand from. So once such a state, uh, uh, once such a successor state has been identified, the search expands um, along this particular direction. So this process of identifying the most promising uh, direction and expanding along, um, along it is repeated until you end up identifying a uh, path to the goal. So this is the whole concept of um, heuristic search. Uh, earlier, we had seen how uninformed search works. So the key point to note here is that um, ultimately, uh, the um, number of promising nodes that were encountered by the search uh, and uh, were expanded from is significantly low in comparison to the total number of nodes that were generated by the search. So the number of promising nodes has been highlighted in blue here, uh, and the number of, um, total number of nodes generated um, can be seen on the slide. So, uh, and ultimately it is these promising nodes that uh, end up determining the optimal path to the goal. So the key idea that lazy search algorithms utilize is the fact that instead of evaluating or validating edges to all of the nodes we have generated, we only validate edges to these promising nodes. This way we can save a large amount of computational uh, effort. So at all points in time, we identify the most promising uh, frontier node and only expand uh, and, uh, and only validate the edge to this frontier node. And once the edge is valid, we expand the search from this node. So this process uh, is repeated and you can see the total number of edges that uh, in the end were validated. It is clearly significantly lower than the total number of edges that uh, were generated by the search itself. So uh, this technique has known to work exceptionally well and improve performance significantly in standard robotics problems. But, the, but as mentioned before, the bottleneck in our uh, problem is a little different where uh, given the robot state as well as the end effector positions, it is querying the optimizer to generate the entire state configuration or the entire action that moves the robot, that is the uh, computational bottleneck. So um, we adopt uh, the same concept as uh, lazy algorithms um, did, wherein given the robot state and the end defector positions, we identified uh, which would be the most promising end defector position in a heuristic fashion, and only generated actions or only when generated the action to this particular end effector configuration. And once uh, the edge or the entire state has been generated to the end effector configuration, the search is expanded from there. So this process of identifying the most promising end effector positions and generating the edge only to them is repeated until you end up finding a path to the goal. So clearly a large amount of computational effort can be saved as the number of queries to the optimizer is significantly minimized. So basically, these are the two uh, sets of uh, optimizations that we do in order to minimize queries to the optimizer, uh, uh, basically boosting the performance. We can also see um, ablation studies towards um, 
at the end of the presentation that uh, basically highlight uh, the impact of uh, both of these optimizations that we have done here. So here, uh, let us see a simple example of um, the impact of the optimization based actions. So on the left here, you can see the um, visualization of the search that utilizes just a predefined action set. Whereas on the right, you see the visualization of the search uh, that uses the predefined action set as well as the optimization based primitives uh, are generated online, which are highlighted in red. So clearly the optimization based uh, primitives that are generated allow the search to uh, quickly progress to the goal and identify a solution. Uh, whereas the predefined action set uh, caused the search to get stuck in a minima and the search keeps um, expanding in that particular region of the state space before uh, for a long time before it ends up progressing. So yeah, this is the whole concept of um, optimization based uh, actions. Um, and uh, that basically brings us to the um, end of the first contribution. Uh, next up, we will very, very briefly go over um, the um, second uh, contribution uh, before getting a sneak peek at the results and um, calling it a day. So the second contribution is geared towards developing a useful heuristic function for our problem. And as mentioned before, a heuristic function basically encourages the search to expand along a direction that is um, highly promising instead of searching the entire region in an uninformed fashion. So it is vital that this heuristic function is informative, um, especially in a domain like ours where the search space is extremely large. And um, searching in an uninformed fashion could take you uh, several hours or days before you end up finding a solution. And in general, uh, manipulation planning problems, uh, uh, a heuristic function that is utilized would be the end defector distance. Uh, so um, basically given a start configuration and a goal, um, minimize uh, the search basically progresses along a direction that minimizes the end defector distance. So this is a fairly reasonable te technique that works very well in practice. Uh, but uh, in, in most manipulation domains, but uh, this does not extend well to our domain be because of the extensive reachability constraints that is present. Uh, take a look at the example here um, where you have the robot start state as well as the blades uh, and uh, the end effect of goal that you would ultimately like the robot to reach. If the search were to progress along a direction that minimize the end effect distance, um, the search would be driven into a minima because um, it would try to find a solution where the robot tries to reach the end effect of the post from over the turbine blades. But uh, such a solution is infeasible because of the joint limit constraints that is present at the base prismatic joint. Hence, uh, the search keeps exploring this region of the state space uh, before realizing that uh, such a solution is infeasible and the robot would have to go around and under the turbine bed in order to reach the goal. So clearly extending the search along a direction that uh, purely minimizes end effect distance is not a particularly sharp idea. So we utilize the concept of what we refer to as homotopy-based heuristics. So just a brief background about what uh, homotopy classes are. Um, given um, two curves uh, which have the same endpoints, um, they are said to be in the same homotopy class if they can be continuously transformed into one another uh, without intersecting any obstacle. So in this particular example, curves tau two and tau three can be deformed into one another um, and hence they are in the same class. Whereas tau one and tau two cannot be deformed into one another because of the presence of the obstacle O2. And they are said to be in different homotopy classes. So um, this is the uh, a high level uh, definition of what uh, homotopy classes are uh, for curves. So what is it in the context of our domain? So given a 2D projection of our planning problem, uh, where you have a start configuration and a goal, the uh, multiple turbine blades end up defining passages that the uh, robot could take in order to reach the goal. Or in other words, the uh, final configuration of the robot could lie in different homotopy classes based on the path it takes to reach the goal. So what we do is that uh, given, a given a planning problem, we end up identifying the most promising um, uh, homotopy classes using a simple algorithm. And uh, so in this particular case, we have identified the two homotopy classes highlighted in red and green, and we end up computing heuristic functions, which uh, where each heuristic function guides the search along a specific homotopy class. So in this specific case, we would compute two heuristic functions where the first one takes the search along the uh, homotopy class highlighted in red, and the other one takes the search along the homotopy class highlighted in green. So these heuristic functions are computed uh, by searching over what is referred to as a homotopy augmented graph. Uh, details about this part can be uh, found in our uh, paper, and uh, I highly encourage audience who are interested to refer to our paper. And once we have all of these heuristic functions, uh, we utilize uh, what we refer to as a multi-heuristic search framework in order to guide the search along all of the homotopy classes simultaneously. 
So a multi heuristic search framework is basically um, a search algorithm that utilizes multiple heuristics in order to expand the search along multiple promising directions at the same time. Um, so given that we have um, multiple heuristics where each of them guides the search along a different homotopy class, the multi heuristic search algorithm here would guide the search along multiple homotopy classes at the same time until we eventually find um, end up finding a path to the goal. So explicitly guiding the search along the different homotopy classes reduces the chances of your search getting stuck in minimas due to the reachability issues. And here is a simple example video that uh, demonstrates um, how uh, the homotopy heuristics are used. So given the planning problem, we identify the homotopy classes and the multi heuristic search uh, basically guides the search along both of the homotopy classes at the same time, as can be seen here, uh, where you see the switch between the uh, configurations. So until uh, so this process is done until you end up finding a solution. So yeah, this is the whole concept of um, homotopy heuristics. Um, it is a fairly uh, simple and straightforward idea that is very, very effective for our domain uh, and uh, other domains where uh, reachability constraints are extensive. So yeah, basically um, now uh, we will briefly go over the results uh, before uh, concluding the talk. So due to the plan difficulty of the planning problem itself, uh, there are no off the shelf planners that uh, work, effective as, uh, uh, work as effective baselines for our domain. So we use modified versions of um, sampling based planners as baselines. So uh, I had uh, mentioned how uh, a sampling based algorithm operates by extending a tree towards randomly sampled states in the configuration space. And to implement this uh, extension of the tree, we utilize the optimization based primitives uh, that we had developed. And that would be uh, basically the RRT OPT. And uh, we use the weighted um, A star search algorithm to perform this extend routine in the RRT search baseline. Uh, the, these were done because of the fact that a vanilla RRT algorithm failed to perform um, even decently enough for our uh, particular domain. So we made our own modifications to it. So um, here are the results uh, for, uh, here are the average results for uh, 30 planning iterations. So um, for all of the uh, planners, uh, a timeout of 1000 seconds was given. So basically if a planner was unable to find a solution within the 1000 seconds, um, it was recorded as a failure. And uh, that is how we define the success rate metric. Uh, as can be seen clearly on the, on the table, uh, the uh, performance of our planner is uh, significantly greater than the performance of the baselines. Um, the success rate is almost uh, twofold higher than the uh, baselines and we have a much lower planning time as well. So in order to understand uh, uh, the impact of the different uh, pieces of uh, the contributions that we had made, uh, here are a couple of ablation studies. Uh, so the first table basically uh, uh, indicates the uh, improvements that are offered by the optimization based primitives, as well as the lazy generation scheme that we had used with the optimizer. So using just a simple predefined action set gave us a mere success rate of 20%, whereas using the optimization primitives along with the predefined action set improved the success rate to 60%, a threefold decrease. And uh, basically using the optimization in conjunction with the lazy generation scheme, uh, raised the performance even further as the search became faster because of the uh, minimal number of queries to the optimizer. And thus we have end up having a success rate of over 80%, which is significantly higher than the 20% uh, that was achieved um, by the baseline. And uh, the second table basically indicates the impact of the homotopy um, based um, heuristics. So the BFS heuristic basically um, indicates the end effect heuristic that I had discussed about. And that provides a mere success rate of 23%, whereas our algorithm has a much higher success rate. So clearly, uh, these ablation studies indicate the impact of the contributions um, that uh, we end up making. Yeah, so these are the major results that I wanted to go over. And uh, yeah, the, it is uh, time to conclude the talk. Uh, basically, um, we have what we have ended up doing in this work is that uh, we have ended up developing an effective uh, search-based planning framework for the task of uh, gas turbine inspection using a snake robot-like manipulator. And uh, for this purpose, we developed uh, the optimization-based um, actions which are generated online in order to uh, allow the search to escape minimas uh, that are created by the predefined action set. And to minimize queries and improve performance of the planner, we um, query the optimizer uh, in a minimal fashion uh, by using the optimization-based actions as an auxiliary action set and uh, developing the lazy generation scheme. And uh, finally, yeah, for the heuristics, uh, we um, utilized and uh, adapted and utilized a homotopy based heuristics in order to reduce the chances of the search getting stuck in minimas due to the reachability constraints.
so uh, that basically um, concludes uh, my presentation uh, thank you for uh, thank you all for listening uh, now i'm i'll be taking questions thank you good perfect thank you very much um, so the given that's a qualifier the process is once again uh, we'll have first uh, questions uh, from the qualifying committee and then uh, uh, questions from the audience uh, it's uh, common uh, for a student on the committee to ask questions first. So unless uh, Drew opposes to this order, maybe we can go with that. Uh, no, I'm happy, I'm happy to ask questions. Go for it. All right. Um, so I'm great talk. I enjoyed it. I have a clarific oh, two clarification questions first about the results. Um, okay. I guess the first is when you instantiate a planning problem, how do you know that it is solvable? And if you don't, you just wait for the 1,000 seconds and then determine failure? Yes, that is how we do it. Um, uh, you can basically estimate whether a planning problem is solvable or not uh, to a decent extent from visual inspection. But other than that, there is nothing you can do until uh, you end up searching the entire space, which can take you several days. So there is no form of actually confirming that the planning problem is unsolvable. So just a uh, higher level visual inspection was done to determine if it was solvable or not. Okay. Um, and for this slide, the results that you show, um, I have questions about, so in the table above, what are the heuristics you're using? And in the table below, what is the action space you're using? Because um, I want your opinion on whether one or the other, the optimization-based actions or the homotopy, homotopy heuristics are have a greater impact on solvability or performance of the planning algorithm. So um, great question there. Uh, so for the uh, first table, um, we utilize the homotopy-based heuristics. And uh, for the second one, we use the action set, which includes the optimization-based primitives as well. So um, both of them are very, very important uh, uh, for our domain because of the fact that the search space is extremely large. So we need as many optimizations as we can do in order to minimize the amount of search effort. Otherwise it is going to take you a large amount of time. So the homotopy heuristics uh, help guide the search along the different homotopies or along the promising regions. Uh, whereas the, uh, the uh, optimization based actions um, help escape the minimas that are encountered while going along that particular direction. So both of them are required uh, to be utilized simultaneously in order to gain the amount of uh, performance improvement that we did. So just utilizing one is insufficient for our part. Okay. Um, so just going off of that, um, in this domain at least, the benefit of the homotopy heuristics shines because there's this nice 2D projection that you can use to compute these homotopies and guide the search along them. But the robot is versatile enough that you might use it for inspection in workspaces or domains that don't necessarily have um, well-defined 2D homotopies. So, and then even in your case, your robot is operating in the full 3D space. So can you talk about how or whether the idea of homotopy heuristics um, will be useful or transferable to domains where you can't easily compute a 2D projection to then determine homotopies to guide the search along? Oh, great question. Um, so uh, homotopy heuristics are uh, not restricted to two dimensions. Uh, there have been works that have uh, utilized homotopy heuristics in three dimensions as well. Um, and since um, it was uh, the major amount of constraints was in the two dimensions that we were dealing with, uh, we utilized a 2D projection of the planning problem and computed homotopy um, heuristics in that particular plane. Um, but yeah, depend, uh, heuristics are, uh, that will uh, work very well for a problem are decent uh, to a decent amount dependent on uh, the domain as well. It is uh, like, likely that <clears throat> these homotopy heuristics are ineffective in uh, domains where you have, uh, in other domains where you have nice 2D projections as well. So um, the choice of heuristic um, is, uh, should be uh, something that is domain dependent and experience driven, I would say. So um, yeah, in this particular domain, it suited our needs to utilize uh, a two dimensional projection and uh, compute homotopies over that. And uh, 
yeah so uh, un until i have a concrete understanding of the different domains that i'm dealing with uh, i would not be able to tell you whether uh, homotopy would be useful um, homotopy heuristics would be useful or not because there are different problems that you can encounter while utilizing such heuristics okay uh, and just final question there a few like hyperparameters in your algorithm so the ones that i noted down are the horizon or the end effector distance that you use to compute successors for optimization there are two weighting parameters in your optimization objective um, and there's the number of homotopy heuristics you use in your multi heuristic search um, can you comment on how much effort it took or how brittle your approach is to tuning these parameters oh um so uh, i wouldn't say uh, that the algorithm is uh, super brittle because it did not take us a large amount of time to converge on um, uh, these hyperparameters so um, yeah the number of homotopy heuristics or the number of heuristics homotopies you guide the search along um, is basically a trade off um, so if you guide the search along multiple homotopies you are spending a large amount of uh, search effort or searching in multiple directions at the same time but that also gives you the added benefit of um, lesser chances of your search getting uh, stuck in a single minima so uh, basically that trade off uh, led to us choosing uh, two heuristic functions or two homotopies so uh, the ultimate caveat here is also the fact that even if your solution doesn't lie along the homotopy or two homotopies that you have guided the search along the search will still end up finding a solution it is it is just that the search will take a long, longer amount of time before converging to that so uh, in this particular case uh, two seemed like the right number for us uh, and uh, that basically was our choice um, and um, as for the uh, other um, hyperparameter of uh, the end effector distance um, so ultimately what we wanted was uh, small movements in the end effector space because uh, we are you are solving uh, an optimization problem in the 21 dimensional space as well so you want to ensure that the generated primitives are actually useful in the sense that it doesn't end up colliding with the environment as well uh, so this is uh, a complex uh, problem to solve so we ended up keeping this um, end effector distance to a decently small number uh, because a larger distance would um, cost the uh, optimizer to generate successors that um, ended up um, colliding with the environment uh, so that led to the choice of this um, end effector distance and uh, yeah it did not take us a large amount of effort in order to identify these parameters basically okay thanks those are all my questions thank Great. you thank you drove um okay uh, let's see uh, michael uh, do you want to go <laughs> next sure yeah thanks for the thanks for the talk so as someone outside of the planning uh, domain um i i was still able to follow that uh, nicely so thanks for Uh, doing a good introduction of all the topics. Thank you. Um, when you originally uh, talked about the heuristics, my first thing that came to mind is um, how how do you identify promising nodes to start with, right? If you go in a certain direction without getting stuck there. But then, when you talked about the homot hom homotopy um, based heuristics, that that kind of makes sense because you have multiple paths to potentially get there. um and and uh, and you can do, do optimization in each one of them however uh you also mentioned at the beginning that the heuristics come with search guarantees do these yes. search guarantees still hold if you apply these homotopy heuristics right so for example if you if you wouldn't identify a certain path um and and the the obvious path that the homotopy identifies are actually not feasible maybe there's something blocking the path like right? would you still be able would you still be guaranteed to find the correct solution eventually yes um so uh, the guarantees are basically um, associated with the uh, search algorithm itself and not the heuristic uh, that mm -hmm. we utilize so um uh, of course uh, there are some properties that the heuristic needs to satisfy in order uh, for the guarantees of a search algorithm to hold but that's besides the point um so what ends up happening uh, when you utilize a heuristic is that the search goes along expanding in a particular direction and once um, it realizes that this heuristic is misguiding you and there is a minima uh, it 
uh, at after expanding a uh, for a large amount of time in that particular direction it starts expanding along other directions to identify if there is a solution uh, in somewhere else in the search space so um, even if your heuristic is uninformed you will still be able to uh, find your solutions except that this time it will just take you a larger amount of time so the guarantees uh, are still um, holding even when utilizing a different heuristic function like homotopy based heuristics so i guess if the heuristic is too informed in some way so it's so it's essentially focusing on some area but not going to another would that be an issue uh, so informed uh, refers to the fact that uh, it is useful for your problem um and uninformed is where it is not useful so if your heuristic is very focused um and uh, if your solution actually lies there then great you will convert your solution very quickly because your search keeps expanding along that direction but uh, if your heuristic is focused and your solution doesn't lie there your search will expand along that direction for a large amount of time and then realize that the solution doesn't lie there and go about expanding along different directions so basically you will just spend a large amount of time uh, amount of your computational effort wasted in these uh, narrow region that uh, your heuristic informed you okay that makes sense um then maybe one question that's a bit orthogonal to what you presented um for 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 these inspection tasks here does it mix it, does contact with the environment matter here so does it uh, potentially help uh you in in guiding uh guiding the snake or or does it hurt in terms of something being in the way and it provides additional constraints so so, um, so i guess what what i want to say is if you could take into uh, into account um contact constraints here uh would that provide better solutions at the end so that also depends a whole lot on the uh, robot system as well um how mm -hmm. fragile your robot system is and uh, how much it can utilize the contacts there are works where uh, the robots utilize contacts in order to reduce the amount of effort that they do um so but however in our system we wanted to ensure that the robot stays away because of the nature of the of the robot and um, yeah basically find parts that doesn't end up colliding at all uh, but i can see where uh, in some cases where it could be useful but in our case we were clear that uh, we did not want that particular constraint okay sounds good thanks that that's all for me for now awesome thank you great <clears throat> thank you michael uh hard mode uh, do you want to go next i can go uh so I One question that came to my mind uh, when you talked about the guarantees of convergence, I assume that the images you get are not 100% information. So there's there's probably some uncertainty in the turbine pictures you get. Um so yeah, that's okay, go ahead. Sorry. And how does this affect your search guarantees or the thinking the other way around? Have you thought about introducing probabilistic methods or uncertainty into your algorithm um thank you hartman for that question that's a great question uh, so um currently uh, we are uh, assuming that we know the model of the turbine that we are inspecting so uh, traditionally uh, you have uh, models of all these turbines and uh, that is already available to us and that is the ones those were used for manufacturing these uh, um these turbines in the first place Uh, and since we are working with uh, working alongside companies that actually manufacture uh, these turbines uh, we uh, assume that we had access to the model but i can uh, but i definitely can see cases where uh, uncertainty um, can play a role in the sense that where there might be parts um, in locations uh, right. uh, you might not want the you might not want it to be uh, there are a class of algorithms which can handle such uncertainties uh i believe that this is uh so but the the, the problem is that um, handling uncertainty is a much more difficult problem and given that this planning problem was already difficult to solve we assumed um that we will have um access to the model and now that we have uh, taken a first step towards solving this problem i definitely think that thinking about uh, uncertainty could be a good direction um to basically focus our um, next efforts on to Okay. And a second more general question. 
and I believe we had this discussion already a little bit, but it just comes back to my mind. I, looking at all those decision and optimization uh, efforts that go into these algorithms, I always come back to thinking about an earthworm that uh, crawls around in dense earth and has lots of obstacles, but seems to get around quite well. And I cannot imagine this small system is doing complex uh, mathematical calculations. So can you comment on what do you think is the difference between the systems and what would it take to build an earthworm robot or search? Uh, that's a much more uh, <laughs> detailed question. Um, so let me think. Um, So um, yeah, I I do understand your question, uh, but the answer to that is that uh, I don't exactly know how the earthworm operates. Uh, I don't know what the reasoning or how uh, uh, it reasons its motions. But uh, what I can say is that uh, this basically uh, can be considered like a first attempt at getting motions that are similar to that of the earthworm. But the the other um, the concept here is the fact that uh, we are not restricted to motions uh, that the earthworm uh, does. Like uh, we, although uh, they might be useful, but in our case, uh, there are also simpler motions that we can do in order to uh, progress towards the goal. So uh, searching in the entire space allows us to do that, but definitely I can uh, see why uh, thinking along those lines can uh, produce like a, uh, solutions that might be uh, very useful for our domain. But I just, I, I still need to uh, think a whole lot to understand uh, how an earthworm functions and uh, understand its mentality before uh, I comment on this. Okay, thank you. That was my question. <laughs> thank you. Harper. All right, great. Um, so uh, I, I'm actually, uh, for the sake of time, uh, and since I communicated with Zahir a lot, uh, I will, uh, um, skip my questions uh, and go straight to audience. Uh, I know, uh, I think there was one question that was already posted uh, by Chris. Um, uh, so we can uh, begin with that question. So here you can maybe answer that question. Chris unfortunately had to go, so you can just kind of answer that uh, for the sake of the audience, and then we'll take questions from audience. All right, um, so Chris has said, uh, my question is about generalizing your approach. It seems to me you are proposing search-based um, planning with a low resolution grid, but where greedy planning works within each grid cell. Uh, you, you are using optimal control uh, to do planning within a grid cell and to adjacent cells. It is like R star where via points are connected by optimization. So anyway, my question is, how would you uh, generalize your approach to other problems? So uh, the ultimate theme of uh, the work that uh, we had done here is uh, basically generating um, actions online in order to accelerate search. So because uh, the traditional predefined action set was not useful uh, enough for our problem, we chose to uh, query an optimizer to do this task for us. And because of the fact that it was, uh, we were unable to reason about uh, what would be a useful action in the entire space, we chose to reason about it in the end defector space. So, but there could be other classes of problems where uh, you can reason about what um, could be an end defector um, or what could be uh, a useful action in the configuration space of the robot itself. So in cases like that, uh, the optimization would directly happen um, to goals which are defined in the end defector space. So it basically uh, depends on the problem. In, in our particular problem, it so happened that we had a different space in where in which we could define uh, uh, useful actions. In other uh, domains, there could be cases where uh, you define it in the same space as the configuration space. So yeah, that, that is basically my answer. The generalization is uh, 
it, it can be done in parts uh, where in in one case you can adopt a particular strategy and in the other case uh, you could do it in a different strategy but the whole concept is that uh, it was is we determined what could be a useful movement online and um, queried uh, a tool to help us generate this so that would be my answer okay all right thank you are there any other questions from uh, audience or for that matter any other questions from the committee uh, i have a clarification question so so when you generate your uh, new actions online do they get added uh, as possible actions for the subsequent expansions that you consider or is it the case that the action set gets reset to the primitives and then again if you get stuck you generate new actions so oh, uh, yeah uh, thank you ashwin for that question that's a great question um no we do not uh, utilize uh, the same action over uh, we basically reset it to the predefined action set uh because uh the configuration is uh, different and uh, different actions are useful in different spaces of the configuration so uh, basically we reset it to the original action space and generate it uh, online whenever required okay and one last one was uh there was some discussion about guarantees going on before so if you were to talk about optimality guarantees that is usually tied to the underlying graph That's and right. the connections and because you are generating actions online you can produce connections which were not present in the original uh graph so in some sense how would we even think about optimality or guarantees in this setting so technically the graph now comprises of the optimal actions or the of the optimization based actions itself so the graph is no more just a predefined action set so the optimality uh, will be defined on this graph that uh, is constructed uh, online but those actions are going to be generated depending on where you end up in your search right so if you don't end up in that region in the search then you might not generate that action that is correct so uh, yeah the this optimality guarantees all these guarantees are tied to the graph itself uh, but uh, it is also we also should keep in mind that we are generating uh, more actions so it means that the solution uh, the optimal solution can only be better than the original graph so that way we the guarantees will still hold the original graph as well it will just do much better than that okay yeah, thank you yeah those are my questions thank you thank you any other questions So oh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, so thank you, sir. That was a great talk. Um, just out of curiosity, did you uh, try to just use like uh, an inverse kinematics approach to finding the joint angles for the manipulator with the representation of obstacles the way you have? So pose everything as a large non-convex optimization problem and see how that performs as a baseline compared to what you have. uh you mean uh doing uh so i didn't quite catch your question what is the exact approach you are proposing so pose collision avoidance as inequality constraints and pose reaching the goal as an objective function so try to uh use you know sines and cosines to represent the position of each link's ending point and the starting point and saying that well i want to the the point the the capsule that is representing the link to be collision free with respect to each of the obstacles that you have and making sure that the end effector reaches that angle so parameterize everything with the joint angles or rotation okay. matrices or whatever yeah. okay uh, got it so we didn't try the exact same thing that you are proposing but we did try a flavor of it where we try to uh, solve a, one single optimization problem that takes us all the way from the start to the goal while avoiding the obstacles we encoded the constraints uh, uh the obstacle constraints basically but that did not work well enough for us and that is why uh, we had to resort to using the optimization basically to generate one step small primitives and utilize that as part of our search algorithm understood understood okay thank you okay. Quick clarification: Do you have an IK solver for this robot? We do, technically, uh, yeah, we do have an IK solver. Yes, uh, your question. But that uh, generally solving in pure inverse statics 
uh, in the 21 dimensional space it might not be as useful because you end up colliding with the environment uh, because of the tight spaces. So you would have to do something a little smarter and that led to this optimization. So, um, okay, are there any other questions? Okay, we're gonna do a countdown until three. One, two, three. Okay, the question session is closed. Um, so, so at this point, uh, uh, everybody has to um, log out uh, and uh, uh, we'll just stick around with the committee, but uh, before Suhail, you, you also have to log out and you, you got to stop recording, but can you make me a co-host? Okay, you, you might do. Okay, okay, fantastic.